Best picture, that coveted prize, that giant among lesser identical golden statues. But how good are these so-called best pictures? Well, I'm going to find out by watching every single one of them. My name is Alex, and I'm going for the gold. Four years in and the Academy Awards are finally getting serious. The awards are beginning to gain national recognition being reported on by various newspapers and radio stations. This also marked the first year that the results of the awards were kept, you know, actually secret until the ceremony. But there are also two important milestone events in the 1931 show. First, Vice President Charles Curtis attended on direct order from President Herbert Hoover, a sign that movies are becoming, as Curtis himself said, the world's greatest and most influential enterprise. But even more telling was that this was the first first time, but, but certainly not the last time, I'm sure, that we have record of a nominee falling asleep during the presentation. And going along with this trend of auspicious events and groundbreaking firsts, one film not only took home the big prize, but was nominated for every single category, a feat only duplicated by 1966's Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. This epic film was a critical darling upon its release, and only lost $565,000 at the box office. Cimarron. Named for an area of land in Oklahoma that itself took its name from a Spanish word meaning wild or untamed. And what do you do with something that's wild or untamed? You break it. <clears throat> Alright, I can't start off any conversation about this movie before describing how very, very... Problematic? That's a good word for it. How problematic this movie is. The Cimarron Territory was one of many areas that was settled in the name of Manifest Destiny. What is Manifest Destiny? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's the dream, nay, inevitability, that this great, God-blessed country stretched from here all the way to here. The U.S. government basically declared that there are areas where people could go and get free land that absolutely no one was living in before with the condition that they live on and tend to the land. And the opening of the film explains that President Harrison has opened up the Cimarron Territory for just this. Thousands of people on horses and in wagons at a sort of starting line waiting for noon because that's the time when the land is officially open for stealing. <laughs> Whoops, I meant homesteading. That's the word for homesteading, not stealing. <laughs> it's here where we meet a man. Not just a man, as we will soon discover. A hero. And, and not just a hero, a legend whose trademark white hat he stops wearing partway through the film. And a man that the movie cannot stop telling us about how great he is. Who is this legendary heroic man? Well, none other than the film's protagonist, Yancey Cravat. And brave, amazing, great, handsome, great Yancey is the nexus around which all the problematic elements of the film spin. Yancey is the living embodiment of the pioneer spirit that Cimarron is trying to portray, but I find that there's a huge disconnect between what the movie wants to say and what Yancey's actions actually say, especially with 85 years of hindsight. For example, let me introduce you to the only named black character, Isaiah. A young boy who idolizes Yancey. He loves Yancey so much that when Yancey decides to move out west, he sneaks aboard Yancey's wagon, and when he's discovered, he pleads with Yancey to let him stay, and he promises to help with chores and such. Isaiah isn't in the movie that much, but the film would like us to believe that he's become part of the family, even though when anyone interacts with him, he's treated less like a person and, and really more like a pet. Did I also mention that Isaiah's first appearance in the film is... This? Isaiah! Now, there are two events in the film regarding Isaiah that I think are crucial to talk about. First is when Yancey and family are heading to church because Yancey has been selected to be the town priest. A thing you can do, apparently. Anyway, the family is heading to church when they hear a roar of laughter behind them, so they turn around to find... Now, because Isaiah feels like he's part of the family, he wants to go with them to church, though he's apparently not family enough to merit an invitation in the first place. However, Isaiah doesn't have nice Sunday clothes, so he borrows some of Yancey's. Now, this would be a great time for Yancey to really accept Isaiah as part of the family and invite him to church. He could say something like, I think you got fine Sunday clothes there, Isaiah. Come on. We'll have a seat up close here, right next to the rest of the family. But that's not what happens. Instead, Yancey promises to buy Isaiah a nice suit, but, but later, which we never actually see him do. And he tells Isaiah that the better thing for him to do is to go home, because without us in the house, it's vulnerable. So why don't you go, and, and go and protect the house? Yeah, go. Away from directly next to us. Oh, oh yeah, here, take this shiny gun! But I think even more crucially is this next scene. 
An outlaw has come to town and starts causing a ruckus. Everyone hides, but one of Yancey's kids is still outside, and so Isaiah risks his own life to go out and protect the child. Meanwhile, heroic Great Yancey single-handedly takes out the outlaw, but not before a stray bullet catches Isaiah, whose last action in life is to reach for his beloved hero while Yancey doesn't notice and just strides on by. And the only consolation we really have for Isaiah is that when his body is brought to Yancey, we see Yancey be sad at Isaiah's death. The movie wants you to get the impression that out here in the free West, racism is just gone. Or at the very least, that there are heroic figures like Yancey that don't care about race and feel empathy towards all people. I mean, look how sad he is. I, I know you can't actually see how sad he is because he's facing away from the camera, but just... He's sad, all right. But here's what it seems to me, and, and this is pure speculation. Cimarron takes place over the course of 40 years. We see Yancey's children become adults, making their own decisions and making their way in the world. If Isaiah had lived, what do you do with him? Is he going to continue to work for the Cravat family as a bumbling, uneducated servant? No, no, that won't look good. He doesn't belong to the Cravat family. He's not a slave. Then is he going to really be integrated into the family? Is he going to share in a family embrace? Are they going to make sure he goes to school and gets the best education like they do for the rest of their children? Does a movie studio in 1931 really want to address racism in any meaningful way? Isaiah felt like the dictionary definition of a token character, a racist caricature that serves only to make Yancey and, by extension, the film itself look better, look like it cares. But once they proved their point that heroic Yancey is this understanding, empathetic hero, they did the only thing they could to avoid all these uncomfortable questions. They killed him. And I think no more apparent is the film's desire to look like it cares than its relationship with Native Americans. Now, early Westerns are often criticized for sugarcoating, glossing over, or just ignoring the negative impacts of Western expansion. But what's kind of extremely frustrating about Cimarron is that it does acknowledge it. Yancey often talks about how sympathetic he is to Native Americans. During the sermon he's elected to give, he strikes up a mandatory collection for a new church organ, a thing you can do apparently but he says that native americans in attendance don't have to contribute because the cherokee is too smart to put anything in the contribution box of a race that's robbed him of his birthright the movie is flat out telling us about these people who have lost so much because of white settlement but at the same time it's trying to tell us how great yancey is for participating in the exact same kind of settlement yancey's newspaper oh, oh yeah yancey owns a newspaper along with being a lawyer was supposedly founded on the premise of writing articles about native american rights it's even got a native american name the oklahoma wigwam but when he gets to town all he wants to do is inaugurate his paper not with an article about the oppression and exploitation of native americans but with an article exposing the murderer of the town's previous newspaper editor, and expose the murderer he does by getting in a gunfight with the man in the middle of church. Did I mention that Yancey's a lawyer? This makes the entire town love him even more and sets the Oklahoma wigwam up as the premier newspaper in Osage. What? Native American rights? Oh, oh yeah. The movie did remember to have a plot point about Native American rights about a half hour before the end of the film, where Yancey wants to publish an article in his newspaper about how Native Americans deserve full citizenship and voting rights, and his wife Sabra, who's racist against Native Americans, tells him that she won't print the article. Quick sidebar. If there is one thing that Cimarron does uh, better than anything else, is its portrayal of women. When I said that Yancey's wife threatened to not print the article, it was because she'd been running the paper herself for several years. Sabre Cravat probably has the best arc of any character in the film. She changes opinions, she grows, she makes difficult choices. She becomes a respected and influential member of the burgeoning community of Osage at a time when women couldn't even vote. Sabre even gets elected as the first female Oklahoma congressman in, in the continuity of the film. I say that because in reality, the first female Oklahoma congressman was Alice Mary Robertson, who was elected in real life in 1921, a full nine years before this milestone happens in the movie. This doesn't have much relevance to the film itself, I just thought it was pretty telling that the world of the movie is actually less progressive than it claims to be. Anyway, even this nice character development is muddled by our glory boy Yancey. You see, Cimarron starts in 1889 when Yancey tries to grab up a nice slice of land during that opening land rush scene. But after he misses out on the claim he wants, he figures if he can't have his acre of land, he'll help build the nearby town of Osage. And so he hitches up his wagon and moves his family there to start his newspaper slash law firm. But then an even bigger chunk of land is open for homesteading and Yancey's allergy to social stability, or as the movie would like to call it, pioneer spirit, starts to hit him and hit him hard. So he tells Saber that they should just pick up and move after spending years in Osage, building a house, building a livelihood, and having two children. And so Sabra quite rightly tells him, no! But Yancey leaves anyway. 
And it's during this time away that Sabre grows from a doting housewife to a dominant business owner. But since the movie is obsessed with following the great, amazing, amazing, great Yancey, we don't see any of this character development. We just skip to five years later when Yancey comes back. And although we do have a woman coming to power in a time and industry of male dominance, her struggle and achievements are glossed over and can't be fully appreciated. And the same kind of thing happens when Yancey wants to publish that article about Native American rights that Sabre objects to. We don't get to see the suffering cause to these people or how that suffering is compounded by lack of voting rights and representation, Yancey just brings up the fact that although Sabre's been running the paper longer than he has at this point, she's kept his name on the front page as proprietor and editor, and so he has the final say. Cut to 23 years later where Sabre is no longer racist, a change we don't get to see and possibly learn from. I think it's also good to mention that the heroic, loyal Yancey left his family again during these 23 years for no other reason than wanderlust? Anyway, we catch up with Sabre after the time skip as the Oklahoma Wigwam is about to celebrate its 40th anniversary. And since this did bother me quite a bit, I thought I'd sum up the fact that Yancey is only home with his family for 13 of those 40 years. Anyway, Sabre is reminiscing on the fact that because of the article that the great, empathetic, amazing, great Yancey published, the government did give Native Americans full citizenship. But the entire conflict about Sabre's racism, Yancey telling her she's wrong, and the great victory in Washington that ended all the problems with the Native Americans, I I'm sure, plays out so quickly and we see so little of the damage being dealt or the improvements that the film claims that the whole ordeal feels more like it's just lip service. Like with Isaiah, it felt like a token gesture. A series of events that lack any real depth and that exist only so that the film can fulfill the notion that the mere acknowledgement of suffering makes it right. But... Instead of pointing a finger at this movie and assigning blame, I think a good way to look at Simran is to ask what it wants to be. So, what does Simran want to be? It wants to be an epic, sprawling story showing the rise of the American West. Throughout the course of the film, we see a small boomtown, or boomer town as the movie calls it, grow into a huge city speaking to the modernization and progress that to them justified Western expansion. It wants to personify the great American spirit with its protagonist, Yancey Cravat, a man who fearlessly and almost effortlessly conquers the West, a man whose setbacks are all someone else's fault and whose drive, sense of justice, and empathy are his greatest aspects. It wants to honor the pioneers that built America, the men and women that scraped a living from the ground to achieve what, at the time, was a national dream, and to see to it that America fulfilled her destiny. And I have to say, I understand. I understand the desire to have all your hardships be in the name of progress. It's not only possible, but very, very likely that there were people watching this movie in the theater who were themselves manifest destiny-seeking pioneers, or the children of those pioneers. People who would love to see their absentee fathers as heroes. People who would love to see gratitude for enduring the desolate conditions of the West. People who would love to see harmony between themselves and the people they wronged to build their livelihoods. I'm sure every single one of us has, at one time or another, justified a wrongdoing. A time where we cobbled together a narrative that not only made our crimes void, but made them look downright heroic. And yeah, I know the devastating, complex ramifications of Western expansion are a little different than when your English teacher didn't understand the nuances of your paper describing the subtleties of Goku's rivalry with his planetary countryman Vegeta, and so your mom probably won't mind if that F is changed to the B it really deserves to be. But if Simran has anything to teach us, it's probably this. When you lie to yourself, other people can tell. Thank you. Man, was Simran difficult to talk about. Oh, God. There was just so much about that movie that was... Uh, atrocious comes to mind. Like I said, the, the only thing that I found that was even slightly compelling was, was the way that it sort of tries to emphasize like the roles of women in these pioneer times. I focused mainly on Sabra in my video, mainly just because she's the most important one. But th there's a couple other smaller things with like the women that build the community. It it's not the strongest, most compelling thing in the world because uh, again, like the, the movie tries so hard to be like, isn't it so great that we stole all this land, but it's, <sighs> I, I didn't want the video to just be, this is bad, that's bad, this is bad, that's bad. I wanted to do a little bit more of the discussion, but boy, was it difficult to do that. Uh, <laughs> and it's a shame, too, because this is, the, this is the first movie that's ever won Best Picture that is a Western. And 
we don't get another Western winner until 1990, almost 60 years later when Dances with Wolves wins. So it's kind of a shame. Like the Western is this iconic American movie genre and we don't get another winner for this long. And the first one we get is kind of horribly racist garbage. But anyways, what are some of your favorite Westerns? Um, I, I wish I knew Westerns more. Uh, like the, the ones that come to mind are like Tombstone, which is a fantastic movie. Um, Hateful Eight, just because Quentin Tarantino is just a fun filmmaker. Uh, and Blazing Saddles, uh, a classic. Although it's a classic because it's making fun of like actual Western classics. And I wish I knew those actual Western classics more. I feel like I'd get more out of Blazing Saddles if I knew those movies. So, um, what are some of your favorite Westerns? Let me know so that I can continue my Western education. (laughs) So until next time, I hope you have a great day, a great week, and a great life. Thanks again.